last 30 years, the forces of democracy have evolved. The Russian army is committing barbaric actions. Welcome to our next conversation on understanding the war. And this time around, we'll be talking about the transatlantic relationship. So basically, the relationship between Europe or the European Union and the United States. You'll remember that in one of the episodes, we addressed this straight on. Uh, this time around, we'll have a dialogue and a conversation with Professor Eric Jones, who is also the director of the Robert Schumann Center here at the European University Institute. Uh, Eric has a long-standing experience, not in, only in things European, but also in American. And probably from, in, from his accent, you'll detect that he has some American roots, even though he's been quite uh, it italified, filed, if I may. <laughs> so welcome, Eric. Really nice to see you. Super, Alex. Thanks for being here. So, uh, Eric, uh, you and I have been in a conversation about the transatlantic partnership for many years, and, and let's try to take this basically in three sets. The first one is, how would you assess the transatlantic partnership uh, before the war started? Where were we in the post-Cold War situation? So, <clears throat> in the post-Cold War situation, the transatlantic partnership had been evolving, let's be honest. When the Cold War ended, the Europeans looked at the opportunity to reap a peace dividend and took it. And the United States, by contrast, tried to shift a lot of responsibility onto the European Union as it was. So you saw that, for example, in the, in the early situation in Yugoslavia. As Yugoslavia disintegrated, the United States stepped back and thought that the Europeans would be able to take charge but then found itself disappointed in the way that the Europeans handled the crisis and, and became more involved. Now, this pattern of trying to shift responsibility onto Europe and then experiencing disappointment and then becoming more involved is one that repeats itself. <laughs> and, and with each repetition, there's frustration on the European side that they're not being allowed to do things their own way. And there's frustration on the American side that the problem is not getting resolved. And, and, and I think if you look at the evolution of the relationship in that context, you can understand why we get these watershed moments, like, for example, when Bill Gates stepped down as Secretary of Defense in June of 2011. This was in the middle of the Obama administration soon after the U.S. had participated in the bombing of Libya. When Bill Gates stepped down, he said, he said to the European allies, look, you guys will have to spend more on defense because it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to defend this transatlantic relationship in the US Congress. Now, I, I'm not sure the European allies really understood the no. significance of that message. Uh, and, and as a consequence, I don't think the European allies were prepared for what came after the second Obama administration. And when Donald Trump came in and delivered that message in much stronger tones, also questioning some of the fundamental aspects of the transatlantic relationship, I think the Europeans experienced a, a, a sharp wake up. Uh, and, and now the relationship between Europe and the United States is in many ways marked by that. It's marked by the, the war in Iraq <clears throat> in the early part of this century. It's marked by that experience with Obama around the Libya campaign. Uh, it, it's very marked by the experience with Obama mm. in the Syria context, and it's marked by the experience of the Trump administration. So prior to the war in Ukraine, I would have said that there's been a big structural change in the transatlantic relationship on both sides, with Americans being somewhat disappointed in their European allies and Europeans being somewhat concerned about the reliability uh, of their partner in the United States. Can I rewind a little bit and go back to 2001 and 9-11? Do you think the Europeans did the right thing at that time? Because, of course, you could say that the transatlantic partnership has been a bit of a one-way street, so it's basically America taking care of European security. Did the were the Europeans good enough on that one? So I think that I, I think that's a really good question, and I'm 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 glad you framed it that way. I mean, you know, we're in the context of war right now, so I'm looking at the transatlantic relationship as a security relationship. But there's the whole economic side mm -hmm. to the relationship that's hugely important, and that's developed very differently. And in in the closeness of the bonds across the Atlantic are dramatic. So maybe I should have emphasized that more. When you point to 9-11, I think those two relationships come together, mm. the economic relationship and the security relationship. And what was interesting in 9-11 was that the Europeans pledged their commitment in terms of security, and the immediate American reaction was, 
Thank you. <laughs> but first, we're going to sort things out, and then we'll call you when we figure out what role you can and play. And even Putin pledged his help to, to George W. Bush, I think. It was, <laughs> that was the moment when uh, George W. Bush, if I'm not mistaken, uh, looked into Putin's soul and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and got a good sense of the man. Yeah. Um, that was before the disillusionment uh, in, in that particular relationship yeah. set in. Yeah. So I remember being foreign minister and I had the you know, opportunity and privilege to engage with both Condoleezza Rice and, and Hillary Clinton. And at one stage, uh, I wrote a speech or gave a speech uh, which was about sort of uh, revitalizing the transatlantic alliance through, you know, a renewal of our marriage wa- vows. But I always felt that there was this sort of waning away and, and there was this sentiment that we were not as close as we used to. On one hand, you know, you had the French view that whatever, NATO is brain dead and we don't need the Americans and, and the rest of it. And on the other hand, you had this sense that, well, you know, you guys start taking care of your own security as, as Bill Gates had had said, but, and I, I sort of, I was almost losing hope in the transatlantic partnership. And, you know, there was a pivot to, to Asia on, on, on the American side. But now we come to this point number two, and, and then that's the war. How, how did this change on the 24th of uh, February this year? I think what, what changed was the sudden realization that the security part of the relationship is actually vitally important, not just for Europe, but also mm. for the United States. Let's not kid ourselves. Mm. The United States needs strong allies in Europe to protect both the world order that the United States and Europeans created at the end of the Second World War uh, and to promote American interests, right? So in that sense, I think there was a wake-up call on both sides of the Atlantic as everybody realized how important they were to one another. There's also been a wake-up call on the difficulty of maintaining this kind of alliance, not just in security terms, but also in economic terms. Think about it. The sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are sweeping, unprecedented, but they're only working because the Europeans and the United States are working together. Yeah. And, and so in that sense, I think the, the relationship has grown closer together. But, but let's not kid ourselves. It hasn't grown closer together in a naive you know, mm. rebirth of, of some kind of Atlantic fantasy. It's grown closer together in the recognition of naked self-interest. And the concern on the European side is that American politics may change. Midterm elections coming up, the presidential elections coming up after that, who knows what administration will be in power. I think the Europeans have to look at the transatlantic relationship and and begin to ask themselves, what would they need to do in order to secure their interests without the active involvement in the United States like we're seeing today? Because what we're seeing right now is the easy part. Holding this alliance together is where it gets more challenging. Yeah, and I, I think obviously we all sort of look back a little bit. What if Trump had been in power during this time? Would we have seen such strong American engagement or not? And what would be your answer as an American Europeanist? I think that's a really difficult question to answer. I think we would have seen strong American engagement because there are good reflexes on both sides of the Atlantic in the context of this kind of conflict. And let's not forget the Trump administration, whatever rumors there may be about a relationship between Donald Trump as an individual and Vladimir Putin as an individual, the, the, the Trump administration maintained the sanctions on Russia throughout its four years in office and, and also worked very closely with European allies in, in bolstering that sanctions regime that was introduced in 2014. So, so it's not unlikely that the Trump administration would have responded in a very similar way. Uh, but, but Trump as president and Trump as an individual would have introduced a level of uncertainty that, that yeah. makes me uncomfortable just to imagine. Yeah. Because, I mean, as, as you said, the unity that we saw in rolling out the sanctions in, in Europe, I guess now five, six waves, uh, and Americans following or being a little bit ahead of the curve has, has been quite good. And it's also been interesting to see actually UK involvement in all of this. So there's that sort of element to it as well. But let, let's go to the third part then and think a little bit about the future. So let's just imagine, say, 2030, the war is over, uh, we hope. Um, where, where do you think America will start pivoting? Because there, there's this sort of school of thought that says, I guess myself included, that Europe was naive on two accounts. One was the reliance on Russian energy. Well, we're getting rid of that. The other one was perhaps the reliance on American security. So w- where do you see the transatlantic partnership going, say, in five to ten years from now? 
So I would, <clears throat> I, w I would start with the idea of the pivot, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we think about the pivot as a pivot from Europe to Asia, but that's not actually what the pivot was. The pivot was a pivot of American security attention from the Middle East to Asia, with the mm -hmm. idea being that Europe would play a more responsible role in the Middle East. Now, obviously, that never took place. It wasn't helped by the fact that the Middle East became so complicated after the war in Iraq. So I don't want to blame the yeah. Europeans 100% for that. But, but the pivot was never successful because the United States remained bogged down mm. in the Middle East. I think that the United States will try to pivot because it has no choice but to pivot. It has to confront a rising China. Mm. Uh, it, it has to assert itself in, in the context of Asia. And, and as it does so, the Europeans will have to fill what gap the Americans leave behind, because the United States cannot be the security guarantor for the Middle East, for Asia, and in fact, it's not really succeeding in playing that role. So what does that mean for Europe? Europe is gonna need not simply to provide for its own physical security, which we're seeing is an effort to do so that's unprecedented in many respects and very welcome, uh, but it's not enough for Europeans to provide for their own physical security. They also have to be able to project force abroad. And that relies on the development of military capabilities that are far beyond what Europeans are imagining. Right now, the, the limits of their imagination are brigade-level <coughs> interventions, mm, right? Okay. And, 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 and what we're seeing is that the, the, the situation actually requires significantly more than that. Uh, and how about then the economic relationship between the US and, and, and Europe? You know, I used to think for a little while back when I was working on a book that we're moving towards a sort of a tripolar world, China, uh, the US, and Europe. But now I see Europe and the US being a little bit closer. But wh where do you see the sort of economic relation moving? Because there is this tendency right now to think about deglobalization, or at least the regionalization of globalization and you know, bringing back um, value chains, etc. Is America going to become more protectionist? Is Europe going to become more protectionist? What kind of ramifications will this have on our relationship? So the, the future of global value chains, at least the way we understand them, is, is one that will retreat from the kind of expansive globalization that we saw. Um, I believe Janet Yellen has referred to it as friendshoring. Friendshoring. Right? <laughs> and, and the idea is that, that we will be building much more communities of trust. Now, let's face it, Europe and the United States have long had an investment relationship, a mutual investment relationship that's far more intensive than any other parts of the world have ever experienced. They have a trade relationship that's very intense as well. And, 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 and on top of that, there's a financial relationship that's very dynamic. And I think these things will come closer together. There's also a change in European attitudes toward China that's mm -hmm. taking place. Right now, China is expressing its support for Vladimir Putin. And, <clears throat> and in, in many ways, this is alienating Europeans. Um, particularly those Europeans that were engaged in the 16 or 17 plus mm. one dialogues That's with China. Point, yeah. um, but, but even more important, we're seeing aspects of politics in China in new light because of their relationship with Lithuania, this very conflictive mm. relationship that they've developed, but also because of what we're learning about their treatment of the Uyghur. And, and, and this is having an impact on attitudes in Germany, it's having an impact on attitudes in Italy, and, and gradually the Europeans are shifting toward a posture that the Americans have been asking them to assume for a long time. So it's not simply that relations are gonna become closer between Europe and the United States, uh, but, but I think the position of Europeans and Americans vis-a-vis -vis China is going to come closer. And that's going to have an impact on the way Europeans do business in China, Americans do business in China, and China perceives this Western alliance. Can I be a devil's advocate here? How about if we would see perhaps, now I'm really devil's advocate and getting into trouble, the Finlandization of Europe vis-a-vis -vis China. So basically, should... Europe play the geopolitical game here between the United States and China, or should there be a clear pivot that, okay, let's stick to the Americans and have the exact same regime? So, <clears throat> so the, the sort of Finlandization, a, you know, that always reminds me of the, the joke about, you know, the Russians talking about, you know, the, the future China-Europe border, right? You know, where Russia gets completely absorbed. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think that the Europeans are going to have to learn to stand up to China on their own mm. 
principles as well. And we've seen that in the European Parliament, for example, where individuals have been sanctioned by the Chinese authorities. And the European Parliament has reacted quite strongly. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine the Finlandization of Europe. I, I do imagine Europe as an independent, strategically autonomous actor, um, but, but in close alliance with the United States. And, <clears throat> and I think there will always be points of difference between Americans and Europeans vis-a-vis -vis China, I just think that those points of difference are gonna become less significant than they were in the past. I mean, when, when in the Trump administration, the, the <coughs> Secretary of State Mike Pompeo came and delivered a very powerful speech about, <coughs> about how the Europeans needed to come to line in China, the European reaction was, no, 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 we're not gonna do that. I, think, I don't think we're gonna see that reaction in the future. Yeah. And in that sense, a good point to end with is that one of the unintended consequences of Putin's attack and Russia's attack on Ukraine has been a much stronger transatlantic uh, partnership and alliance and we're seeing it manifest itself in many different ways. We don't know at this stage whether it's going to last or not, uh, but it's been really fascinating, Eric, to talk to you and uh, thank you very much for your insights. And as someone who is an avid transatlanticist, I do hope that that partnership will continue to be strong. Uh, this was our episode on uh, transatlantic, uh, the transatlantic partnership uh, and the ramifications on the war in Ukraine. And as you can see, uh, it does have many of them. Next time around, we'll see what the subject is. Thank you very much for following. The Russian army is committing barbaric actions. This is it.